It's the console that started a home entertainment revolution. The Nintendo Family Computer, also known as the Famicom. Steeped in consumer-centric ideals and innovative ideas, this console shaped the landscape of the home video game market that we know and love today. Join me in this multi-episode series where I deconstruct the Famicom and explore the inner workings of this amazing 8-bit home video game console. As I reflect back on my childhood, I have a very vivid memory of using the Nintendo Entertainment System for the first time. I was at my friend Jason's house when I first laid eyes on Super Mario Brothers. I couldn't stop thinking about it and wondering, how in the world does this thing work? It must be magic. Well, 35 years later, and I have to admit, the wonder is still there. Though I realized since then that it's not magic. Now in this series, I'm going to talk mostly about the Famicom, which is the Japanese version of the console. But I'll also be covering various aspects of the North American Nintendo Entertainment System along the way. Even though there's differences in the design, the foundations of the architecture are largely the same. But there are certain areas where I want to put the two side by side and show you the differences. All right. We'll start off this episode by exploring the overall design. The Famicom was first unveiled in Japan at the 1983 Tokyo Toy Show. Nintendo had already built up a solid arcade business and successfully launched into the handheld game market with its Game & Watch product line. The home video game console market in Japan was starting to gain interest, so Nintendo jumped in at just the right time. The Famicom launched in July of 1983 at an introductory price of 14,800 yen. The price of the games varied, but cost around 5,000 yen apiece. If this is your first time getting a look at the Famicom, you'll notice that it looks more like a toy than a high-tech video computer system. The controllers are hardwired into the console itself, which prevents them from getting lost. And there's even a slot that they slide into to keep the setup looking tidy. Most of the time, you'll find the Famicom controllers with the iconic D-pad and round A and B buttons, similar to what you see on the NES. But they didn't start out that way. Early versions of the Famicom actually had square A and B buttons. Nintendo changed this design in 1984 after they issued a recall on those early consoles due to defective CPUs. Because of the recall, these square button units are somewhat rare, but a neat piece of Famicom history for the collector. Unlike the controllers on the NES, the first player and second player control pads are different. You'll notice that the second player controller has a microphone built in and is missing the start and select buttons. On top of the unit, there is a plastic flap which flips back to reveal the cartridge slot. The Famicom games are roughly the size of a 3x5 index card, and they get inserted into this slot. Sitting in front of it is a completely superfluous eject button, which Nintendo purportedly included to entice children to play with the unit even when it wasn't turned on. But as you'll notice, many of the eject buttons on these units have gotten broken and cracked over the years by enthusiastic gamers putting pressure at the top of the sliding switch instead of the base. Sitting on each side of the eject button is the power switch and a reset button. In the front of the console, you'll find a 15-pin expansion port. This is used for additional accessories such as a third-party controller or even a keyboard. The first generation of Famicom consoles were all RF-based devices. So in the back, you'll find a port for the RF switch and a channel selector next to it. And next to that, there's a switch labeled TV or game. When flipped to TV, this switch disables the output on the RF modulator so you can watch TV on the channel that the RF signal's using while keeping the Famicom turned on. 
Now this is interesting because it's not something that you'll normally see on a console. And indeed, it was removed in later versions of Nintendo's game systems. The Famicom uses a standard 7805 voltage regulator to knock the input voltage down to 5 volts on the mainboard. Because of this, you have some leeway on which power adapter you can use. Any excess voltage going into the 7805 needs to be dissipated as heat. So if the adapter has too high of a voltage, you'll damage your Famicom. If there's too little voltage, the regulator may drop out and not provide the necessary 5 volts to the system. Therefore, the recommendation is to use a power supply that provides somewhere between 9 and 11 volts. But you need to make sure that the power supply is center negative. This means that the center of the barrel jack puts out the negative side of the power, while the outer sleeve provides the positive side. If you plug a center positive power supply into your Famicom, you will blow capacitor C25. Don't ask me how I know. Interestingly enough, this is quite different from the way a North American NES works. In contrast to the Famicom, the NES actually uses an alternating current power adapter instead of a direct current adapter. Here I have the original NES AC power adapter hooked up to my oscilloscope. And as you can see, the voltage constantly changes between positive and negative. In contrast, here's a DC adapter that you can use with the Famicom. Notice that it provides a steady 9 volts instead of fluctuating between positive and negative voltage. Because of this, you can't plug an AC adapter from an NES into your Famicom. The negative voltage from that adapter could also blow capacitor C25 or damage the 7805 voltage regulator. But with that said, you actually can use the Famicom's DC adapter in the NES. And that's because the NES has a bridge rectifier built in to convert the alternating current to direct current. To see how this works, let's take a look at the power portion of the NES schematic. Now, I want to point out that this is the standard NES-001 schematic that's floating around online. But this schematic is actually not correct. The diodes in this rectifier circuit aren't in the right orientation. Instead, two of these diodes need to be flipped around. Okay, so now this portion of the schematic is correct, and these four diodes form a standard full wave bridge rectifier. When you use the NES AC adapter, the diodes act as gates to only let through the positive voltage. But if you use a DC power supply, the constant positive voltage will just be passed straight through the rectifier as if it wasn't even there. Let's now take a closer look at the mainboard. If you remove the six screws underneath the shell, the bottom lifts off and you'll find the mainboard inside. The earlier models used two separate PCBs. The smaller one is a single-sided board for the power circuit and the RF modulator. This board's attached to the main board with a 7-pin ribbon cable. The main board is a two-sided PCB with the cartridge slot soldered to it. Taking a closer look at the main board, we'll find the CPU, which is an RP2A03 made by Rico. This chip contains a modified 6502 processor which we'll look at in more detail in another video. But in addition to that, this chip also contains the audio processor. And next to this is the RP2C02. This chip is the video processor, which Nintendo calls the PPU or picture processing unit. The chip labeled U1 is two kilobytes of RAM for the CPU to use as working memory and U4 is another 2 kilobytes of RAM, which is dedicated to video memory. The remaining chips are buffers, a latch, and an address decoder. We'll talk more about these chips in upcoming videos in this series when we examine how the Famicom works more closely. There's one other chip which you won't find on the Famicom, but you will find on the NES, and that's the lockout chip. 
This chip was added by Nintendo for North American consoles to give them control over the third-party game market. This was Nintendo's way of making sure that games met their quality standards and thus preventing another major video game crash like we experienced in 1983. This layout was revised many times over the years, but it really came in two different major versions. The first is the HVC CPU version, which was used in 1983 when the Famicom first launched up through 1988. There's different revisions of this particular board, but the most common by far is the 07 revision. In fact, three out of my four original Famicoms are all 07s. In 1988, Nintendo made their first major update to the board in an effort to reduce the interference that it produced. These versions, which are labeled with GPM, all have the RF modulator soldered to the main PCB. And then later revisions have additional metal shielding that's been added in. This is the board that Nintendo used up until 1993 when they changed the design once again. That's when they introduced a new version of the Famicom, which is sometimes called the AV Famicom. The major differences with this version were detachable controllers and component video and audio. At this point, the NES control deck already had component AV since its launch, but this was new for the Famicom. And it's at this point that you see Nintendo institute a practice that they held on to for many years. Instead of placing RCA jacks directly onto the AV Famicom like they did with the NES control deck, Nintendo used a custom AV cable port. On the left, I have the main board from an AV Famicom, and on the right, the main board from a Super Famicom. If you look at the rear, you'll see that both the AV Famicom and the Super Famicom use the same AV cable port. Now, if you're from North America, you may have noticed that the AV Famicom is very similar in design to the second generation of the NES, which is more commonly known as the top loader. But there's a couple of major differences between the two. First, notice that the AV Famicom has a flat lid, but the top loader NES has a rounded lid. The reason for this is so you can use a memory expansion adapter with the Famicom, which lets you connect a special accessory called the Famicom Disk System. In addition to the lid, the cartridge slots are different sizes and shaped differently since the Japanese and North American game cartridges have a different size and shape. You'll also notice that the AV Famicom retained its 15-pin accessory port, which the NES top loader doesn't have. The other major difference is that Nintendo reversed course, and after eight years of having the original NES control deck in market with AV output, they removed it in the top loader and provided only an RF modulator. And this wasn't the only cost-cutting measure that Nintendo made. Surprisingly, they also removed the infamous 10NES lockout chip. And then, two years later in 1995, they reversed course again and released a new version of the top loader with AV output instead of the RF modulator. Now, this newer top loader NES is quite rare. In fact, it's so rare that many people questioned its existence and thought it was a hoax. Now, I've never seen one personally, but I've been on the lookout for one for quite some time now. And it doesn't stop here. There's also been other variations of the Famicom over the years. One of my favorites, which we'll definitely be talking about in a future episode in this series, is the Sharp Twin Famicom. This unique console combines both the traditional Famicom and the disk system into a single unit. The design of the Famicom is so rich and it's worth exploring in depth. So while this video provided a high level view of the overall design, I'm going to drill in quite a bit deeper in other videos in this series. We're going to pick apart the Famicom piece by piece and take an in-depth look at how the technology works and some of the interesting background behind it. If you enjoyed this, then be sure to subscribe and stick around 
because I'm nowhere near done with the Famicom yet. I'll see you in the next episode. But until then, go make something cool.